All right, so are you building your sales on Amazon and you're thinking about how do I grow sales off Amazon? Because maybe you have your own product or you're selling wholesale or whatever the case is. And you're like, I got to get sales off Amazon. So I know that's a, a dream many of us have that we put varying levels of uh, intentionality into and something I know I could be more intentional on, definitely. So I'm excited to have with me here today uh, someone who knows quite a bit about selling stuff off Amazon and has helped people actually go from on Amazon to off Amazon and growing that as a sales channel. I've got the host of the unofficial Shopify podcast, Kurt Elster. Kurt, thank you so much for being here on Maximizing E-Commerce today. Oh, thank you for having me. My honor and pleasure. Awesome. 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 Well, let's get into it. So can you tell everybody a little bit about your background in the e-commerce world? I have been working in e-commerce for most of my adult life, thanks to eBay, making it, you know, 15 years ago, making it so accessible. I found myself as a, an e-commerce channel manager for an auto parts drop shipper 11, 12 years ago. And my, my entrepreneurial spirit told me, I'm betraying myself. I got to go out, hang out my shingle. And so I foolishly put in my one week notice and said, I'm going to build my own e-commerce platform. Lo and behold, that's a lot harder than it sounds. Actually, <laughs> right. it sounds very difficult. Um, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, it took me five years of evolving and iterating on that business. So there's no failures when you're pivoting. Um, and eventually I came to find myself uh, about five or six years ago, we said, let's just niche down, let's laser focus, let's serve only Shopify merchants. You know, and maybe there were 100,000 Shopify merchants at that time. Mm. But that was, you know, I, I was in the right place at the right time. Having that focus was very beneficial. I started a podcast on the topic then and just started working in public and creating content. And now today there are 12,000 Shopify partners like myself, but a million merchants. So having oh, that wow. niche still worked because there are, that's 83 merchants for every Shopify partner. Um, oh, wow. So it worked very well. And so I, I just stuck with that, um, kept showing up because consistency is key. And now, now here I am with the, the podcast has a million downloads. Um, we've got some big clients like Jay Leno, uh, Hoonigan, just this big automotive lifestyle brand, uh -huh. um, some other, some other interesting, William Murray Golf, we've done some work for them. So it's some, some cool stuff. Nice. Now, have you gotten to meet Jay Leno himself? Uh, yeah, a couple times. And I got to tour his garage, which really? was a surreal experience. You know, you're in this thing that's like an automotive museum with 200 cars and 200 motorcycles and some of the rarest stuff you can imagine. And they all have these incredible... Uh, provenance behind them and nearly all of them run and they're driven regularly and then you have to remind yourself this is just some guy's private garage right um and sure enough they said you know we we don't guarantee you'll meet jay but if he's around i'll introduce you so i well, appreciate it uh -huh. um and the guy goes uh, who's giving the tour he goes oh hey jay i got somebody you should meet and sure enough i look up there is adjusting the timing on a lincoln that he was going to take out that day well oh, like wow. himself and he looks over up and he goes, it's not another one of your Tinder dates, is it? So that was, <laughs> Always the not, jokester. <laughs> did not disappoint in the slightest. And he, so from my experience, like when I saw him, he just got his hair cut. He's wearing the denim. He's literally working on a this unassuming vintage car he's going to take out, take uh -huh. home that day. And so, and then he like cracks a joke. So from my perspective, he is 100% exactly like on TV. And I that don't want awesome. anything to change that. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Because I, I, I've seen things online about his garage and it's like a museum yes. of like all these different cars. What was your favorite one you saw there? Oh man. Well, what's, what's cool about it is they all, many have stories. So it's like, oh, this is this, you know, a, a 1967 Dodge Challenger. And like, it's cool. But then you go, when Jay retired, um, oh shoot, who's that, that gigantic country singer? Sings Achy Breaky Heart. Oh, um, his name. Miley Cyrus's dad. <laughs> Billy, Ray Cyrus. Billy Ray Cyrus. No, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It wasn't Billy Ray Cyrus. Just rattle off some country singers. George Strait. Nope. Bigger. Um, Johnny Cash. <laughs> Tim McGraw level big. Oh, Tim McGraw. Um, I don't know. I'm trying Garth to think. Brooks. Garth, Garth Brooks. Garth oh, Brooks. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I believe it was, a, all right, it was a country singer. I think it was Garth Brooks. Just gifted it to him. So it's not just oh, wow. like you've got these cars plus the provenance behind it. Um, you know, I'll tell you my favorite was this red Lamborghini Countach uh -huh. because like I'm 37. So like every kid right. my age had, saw this, either had this as a poster or a trapper. Oh, I had a poster of it in my Exactly. Wall. Yeah. 
and it's red and had this cream leather interior. And what was issued about this car? It was the first exotic that Jay had ever purchased. And many of the cars are restored, but some are intentionally unrestored. And this one, the, the, the leather bolsters were not repaired. So you could see it was the wear from Jay getting in and out of that car over the years because he really drove it. And so oh, I thought wow. that, was, that was cool that that was left alone. Um, but then the exterior was like perfect. Right. Um, that one just for like that history and the fact that you like, that was every little, my age, every little boy's dream car. Oh, absolutely. It was like what started Jay's car collection. I, that was my favorite. Yeah. That's a, it's funny. Cause there's a, there's a body shop here in town where I live in suburban West Palm beach area. And like in the roof, they've got sticking out of the roof, the rear end of a red Lamborghini Countach. And so when you said that, I was like, oh, it made me think of that right away. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So, all right. So let's talk, let's talk shop here. So I suppose, I suppose, I suppose. Yes. Yes. So what have you noticed is kind of that mindset of someone who's, you know, used to Amazon bringing them the traffic. And even when they run ads on Amazon, it's still, still, there's a very Amazon way of doing things. And when yes. you go off Amazon, things are different. And so what have you found is kind of that successful mindset people need to have to be able to successfully do both or completely transition off Amazon, whatever their goal is. So we've, we've done set up um, many Shopify stores for successful Amazon sellers. Mm -hmm. And the conversation almost always goes the same way. It's like, well, I started selling on Amazon and either it's like the first product they started with, or maybe they tried a few and they land on one. They're like, this thing's really successful. And I mean, there's been stuff where people are like, Within a month, they're doing six figures, just crazy success stories. Right. And every single one of them is terrified because you have this tremendous business, this tremendous income, mm -hmm. and you don't own the channel. So at any point, right. Amazon could, like, there could be some violation or, you know, some BS from a uh, unscrupulous competitor. There's any number of threats you have and essentially a single point of failure in your entire income stream when your business is centered around just Amazon and you don't own that channel. So that's scary. Mm -hmm. So really it's more people say, I want to build a brand. Mm -hmm. I want to, and I want to diversify my risk and I want to own the channel and the customer experience. And so like, those are the three things that drive them to say, all right. And no one says I'm going to shut my Amazon store down. They want to do these things in parallel. They want them simultaneously. And mm -hmm. I think that's great um, because you don't have the pressure to get like ramp up and be successful very quickly when you're already successful on Amazon. So you can take your time with it. You don't have to make um, potentially uh, silly decisions because you just, that pressure has gone. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is it's much easier to get onto Amazon as a, or to get onto Shopify as an Amazon seller because Amazon is very particular about their product listings, right? Mm. So I know Anytime I work with an Amazon seller, I'm going to have fantastic product listings to work with. And Amazon mm -hmm. sellers put a lot of effort into optimizing those product descriptions. Yes. That someone who started with Shopify never had to really think about, not in the same way as an Amazon seller. Mm -hmm. um, like all of your success on Amazon is linked to how good and convincing that product description is. So they mm -hmm. bust objections. They treat them like sales letters. I, and they've got great consistent photos. I love them. So those translate extremely well to Shopify. Just uh -huh. Copy, paste, migrate that thing over. Um, the thing where Amazon sellers then struggle is two, two things. Number one, the branding is never as strong. So mm -hmm. a Shopify merchant, often they think a lot about design and branding. And that, you, as an Amazon seller, it's just not because Amazon owns the customer experience. You never have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, so they tend to be, the Amazon seller sites are very plain for that reason. They don't have a ton of content around themselves, which I think is a misstep. Um, and the branding is usually like a simple logo and then that's it. Like there's nothing really more to it. Um, but another advantage the Amazon sellers have here, and I love this every time I start when I go, when we list your store, you don't have to advertise at all. And I promise you'll get a sale faster than you think. And People are like, yeah, right. This guy's full of it. And I worked with a guy years ago and we're working with him again now. And he told me, he goes, Kurt, you told me that. And then we, we law, um, they had like a brochure site that didn't sell anything. They were successful on Amazon and in store. And then we put the site up 
on Shopify. The same day it goes up, an order comes in. And the guy goes, I thought oh, wow. it was like, he goes, I thought it was you being with me. I thought <laughs> it was like you had placed an order on the store to make that, that prophecy come true. And no, because when you're an Amazon seller and you're successful, you will have customers, potential customers who Google you, who Google the product title, who Google the SKU, who Google you, the vendor mm-hmm. or the seller, um, and then go to your store and they just, mm-hmm. they sometimes, some people, and for a variety of reasons, are more comfortable when they feel they're purchasing as direct as possible from the manufacturer. Mm. And so you do, you will, autom- you will siphon off a percentage of those Amazon sales just by having a shop by store if you're successful at Amazon. Now, I don't know what like the threshold is where this happens and it's enough to justify it, but it will happen. So that's right. kind of cool. Um, I, I could just keep rambling here. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> no, no, that makes perfect sense because yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Everyone on Amazon has been trained and focused on, you know, it's all about the listing and the keywords and, you know, you want to write it in a way that makes sense to a human, but also picks up on all the keywords that Amazon's algorithm would yes. look for, which also I would imagine would generally be pretty good for Google SEO, although that's a whole different ball. Amazon. Game. Yeah, Amazon is a search engine at mm-hmm. its core. When you land on Amazon.com, yep. there's just a giant search box and they're like, type in what you want, stupid. Because how else are you going to deal with a catalog that size? Right. So fundamentally, all Amazon sellers, whether they're even thinking about it or not, have, if they're successful, they have search engine optimized and really like optimized for humans, for the terms people are searching for. Right. Um, and they have these product descriptions that are optimized for people, these long form sales pages. Mm-hmm. Whereas like I love um, the refrain you always hear from Shopify merchants. People don't read. It's not true. They do. They skim. They find things, they, the point they need, and then they read that. And that's where Amazon's um, seller descriptions are brilliant. It leads with bullet points. Then it's broken up by headlines and images. And then there's in-depth text in there. So they're very easy to scan through and then pit read like, okay, well, this is the point that I'm, I'm concerned about. So now I could read about that. Um, and that's uh, such a, a point in the favor. So always make sure like if you, you know you're successful with your description on Amazon, start by just duplicating that 100% on Shopify. Nice. So would you recommend that the format on like a Shopify store would be very similar to title, bullets, description, kind of like we do on Amazon? Oh, 100%. And so um, where I think people get tripped up is more in the technical implementation of that. Mm. Um, So almost all Shopify themes now support this like barely documented feature called split. And Mm -hmm. like, if you look at an Amazon description, it's like photo, we'll call it the buy box. So at Mm -hmm. the top of the page, where it's like title, photo, the, the, the description summary, so just those bullet points, mm-hmm. that's the buy box. And then everything after that is like the real long form description. In Shopify, there's a thing called split. So you write uh, as an HTML comment in your description, the word split. And then everything before split will be like part of that buy box. Everything after that will be the full width of the page. So pretty much every Shopify theme, even though it's not particularly well documented, will right. support that like that basic layout that uh, Amazon does. That's interesting. Yeah. Here's another one. You can upload um, the, the photo box that Shopify uses. They now call that the, like, the media editor or whatever because now it'll support 3D objects, so you can just natively upload them, and it'll support video. So just like on Amazon where you upload photos mm. and video, now you mm-hmm. can do that in Shopify as well. Interesting. I'm writing a list of tasks I need to do in my own shop for my <laughs> store. Yeah, go, uh, Google that split thing. The other thing with like some of the fancier themes will let you build, will have um, multiple product templates. Mm-hmm. And that gets a little complicated because you can only apply one template per product. Um, the, so like you, you know, maybe just pick your single bestseller. But what's also nice about Amazon sellers is they usually have like a focus set, a focused catalog. They mm-hmm. rarely do you counter an Amazon seller who has hundreds of items. It's like usually at most a couple dozen um, and off, often less than that. The, uh, those product templates will let you do like fancier stuff, fancier than you could do on, on Amazon even. So you can mm-hmm. take that content you have and then really polish it up and have a, a really nice customer experience. And with like full bleeded background images and then text over that. 
you make it very cool if you want to. Nice, nice. So there's a lot you can do. And that's the nice thing is when you're on your own store, you have a lot more freedom than Amazon, which says, here's the guidelines, fill in your bullet one here, bullet two here, bullet three, and then just, you know, it's basically form fields. So, okay. So now we've got to bring people there. So as you mentioned, this is the hard part. Right, exactly. Exactly. This is where it doesn't translate quite as easily. So yes, there's going to be the people that are going to do um, brand lookups because they're on you know, Amazon, they see your brand name and then they go over to your store just to compare the pricing or maybe they just want to go directly because they look at Amazon more for the reviews and they do to buy from or whatever the case is. But that's a small fraction of the potential for sales. So how do you bring people over? Because it's not like Field of Dreams where it's just you build it and they just come necessarily. And so like normally you build it, nobody shows up. <laughs> right. The, Right. That's like that. That's if I just spin up a Shopify store, the most beautiful, amazing store ever, no one's going to go. It's just, it isn't going to happen. And so I always, um, you know, try and prepare people for this when they're building their Shopify store. It's like you, before it's built, you got to start marketing. You got to start building your list. Amazon sellers, you get that, like there's that base level of success from, from the brand lookups for people who Google you. Right. Um, and are often like loyal past customers who see their, you know, it's like, Oh, I should buy one of those things. The thing I liked, as a gift. Like, oh man, I just, I love that RoboCop vinyl figure. All right, I'm going to give that as a gift. So I Google it. Oh, and now instead of the Amazon listing, because Shopify or Google will always try to, if it's like a branded term, will mm -hmm. always try and prefer what they view as like, this is the branded website for that. Right. Um, so and then you're not, you're making it up on not paying uh, the Amazon fees. Right. Um, but you got to drive traffic to the store you don't have the emails from the customers. You don't have the name. You have nothing, so you can't run custom audiences. This mm -hmm. is where you're at a disadvantage. Hope maybe you were smart and you had a thing like register your warranty and you've been collecting emails through that. Maybe you did something where you're able to put together an email list. Well, right. if you got that far, that's going to save you and that you can use that to create a lookalike audience on Facebook to start generating traffic. So since we know people are doing the brand lookups, I would 100% start with Google Shopping as my mm -hmm. channel, you know, you like you search for something and then it pops up with like right at the top of the search results, like image price. Uh, if you're lucky, you've got rating on there. So Google shopping is great, a great place to start. Um, it'll be more familiar to Amazon merchants um, as a channel. Technically, it's a little difficult to set up. So maybe you want to hire somebody to do it. But once you've got it running, it's much more, much less complicated, much more straightforward versus other PPC channels. And those buyers are very more qualified. Right, because I'm already I'm looking for this literal product. I type in fire hose wallet, and then the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a wallet made out of fire hose. Like you can see where right. those are very qualified um, buyers. From there, okay, so that's our easiest was the branded people, and I'm doing in terms of conversion, right? Mm -hmm. So our easiest to convert are the branded search people. Now I need the uh, high intent buyers. So that's Google Shopping. Okay, from there we're gonna move into the really the difficult but most rewarding space, Facebook ads. And that's mm. where we need to think in terms of a sales funnel because this is more interruption marketing. Like I'm scrolling and I see an ad and a successful ad we call a thumb stopper. Because when I'm going through Facebook, I'm just scrolling my thumb, scrolling my thumb, and you need to overcome the literal inertia of this page scrolling mm. with an ad interesting enough for me to stop, consider it, click through on it, to your site, at which point I'll probably be like, whatever, and bail. Now is where you need uh, remarketing ads on Facebook. So may, lots of people may Google find, refer, um, talk about, reach your website and not purchase. In fact, an average conversion rate is probably about 2%. So what do we do with the other 98% of people? That's where we want those remarketing ads. And that's a, the cold traffic ads are going to be the most expensive. That's where you're, you're going to lose the most money trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And expect to lose money for the first month possibly two months um, to, to make this work. Those remarketing ads though are gold, much less expensive to advertise to what we call a warm audience. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully those, that's where the conversion happens. Once it does. So you like, let's say you could show them ads for your site. You could show them like, I love doing a video. That's like the top five reasons to buy. Um, those can work very well, or you could do it as a slideshow if you're testing different content. And then from there, um, the you could also remarket to people who made a purchase. Ah, now we can really extend customer lifetime value, raise our return on ad spend, 
raise our return customer rate, um, and extend our customer lifetime value, all of a sudden, like all these revenue metrics are mm -hmm. going up in our store and you really start to see the power and the value. Cause when I like I, your customers on Amazon are largely one-time purchases and you don't have a way to get back in touch, to remarket to them. Right. Suddenly Shopify, once you get over that initial hurdle, so we'll say your first 100 orders, if you can go zero to a hundred, okay, pretty good. Now we, we've got our, our core initial list of people. Now you can start scaling it and we can get that to a thousand and then 10,000, right? So you mm -hmm. see, you get these, these network effects, this thing's like a snowball. Um, and then from there, like the thing that you never had access to, email. Oh my gosh, you can start setting up newsletters and you can set up marketing automation with a tool like Klaviyo. So you can start building a relationship with your customers. You can start being the face of your brand. Maybe you're lucky you're in a niche thing or a hobby thing and, you, and you're passionate about it. You can start creating content around it, mm -hmm. right? So suddenly now we're moving into, oh my gosh, you could build a community, right? Oh, I could, you could start a Facebook group and maybe get mm -hmm. a few thousand people in there. So you unlock all of these things once you own the channel, own the brand, and have a list. But the hard part is just in that initial list building. That's, that's what makes or breaks people. That's where people struggle. And I think where a lot of people get hung up um, is you go into like the Facebook ads manager or whatever they call it, and you start thinking like, oh, I could do this. I could retarget. I could do this. And it's like, it becomes overwhelming of all the yes. things you could do compared to Amazon where it's auto campaign or manual campaign. I mean, there's, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the two main buckets people tend to play in. So what, what would you say is that first thing you should test on Facebook? Is it content? Is it going straight to the sales page with cold traffic? Is it building an email list? Is it a little bit of all of the above? And where, where, what would you recommend to the newbie who's listening, who's not really done much on Facebook, but they've thought about it? It's, it's so hard. I, so number one, I would make sure I have a remarketing campaign in mm -hmm. place because it, it's going to be a, a lot tougher to test a cold traffic ad mm. um, than when you don't have that remarketing in place. So like we know fundamentally if I increase the total number of touch points a customer has with the brand and I could do it in a, you really realistically a six day window. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got like a abandoned cart emails that go out. Maybe I've got a welcome email series that I got mm -hmm. them to sign up for when they visited the site. Um, and that's where like pop-up strategy is a thing. Um, so first I would make sure I've got my touch points in place. And then realistically, like you've got that, maybe you've got that really good, Amazon sales page, that product page. So you can mm -hmm. send them to that as your landing page. If I want to make this funnel fancy, real like this is this is what I would build out. I create a a blog post, an article, a landing page that's a resource for people who would be who would benefit from and would be interested in my product. Right. So let's mm -hmm. say I sell um, a retinol anti aging cream, okay. and I would create an article that just talks about like. Uh, Hey, here, and I know who my, my target audience is. So it's like women um, age 35 and above. And I'd say, all right, well, you're starting, this is a concern. So I'd have an article just about that, about the topic. I would drive traf cold traffic to an educational article. I would not attempt to sell them. Maybe I've got a pop-up. Uh, if I want to get fancy, I've got a content upgrade. So like they give me their email and in mm -hmm. exchange, they get a, a welcome series that's more in depth on this topic. But then at the same time, all right, I'm remark now I'm remarketing them to the product. Because by virtue of visiting and reading that page, they have raised their hands as my potential customers. So I right. need something, some tripwire that indicates, that separates the wheat from the chaff. It shows me, okay, these are the people that I should spend the money on trying to reach and really put in the effort. So I think number one is don't just try and run, like create an ad, even if it's a great ad and it's well-targeted and just run it to a product page. Because you're just going to bang your head against the wall. Think in terms of a sales funnel. Mm -hmm. And really it's, it's just it's one additional piece of content. It's a, an article or blog post that's a resource that's beneficial that would identify, help identify people who are your target market. And then you remarket to those people with your product. This, the highest converting stores we've ever worked on, that's the strategy they use. And it's like, and very few people do it because, oh, well, it's extra work. It's not that much extra work. It's right. one extra page. 
Well, but that makes sense because at the end of the day, you got to have people kind of raising their hand and saying, I'm interested. The thing of it is on Amazon, the second they went to amazon.com and looked for something, they said, I'm interested because they're that's a very qualified. Exactly. Very highly qualified, high intent. They're not going there to research, you know, something or look at their friends pictures or whatever. I mean, they're there for buying, but off Amazon, you got to have people at least raising their hand because otherwise, you know, it's like going to a mall and saying, Hey, who wants retinol cream in the middle of the food court? <laughs> you know? Yes. You, no, it, it really is. Yeah. You want people that are coming out of the store that sells retinol cream or you know, anti-aging products. It's like, you want to know that that's the person, you know, who's going into that store or is interested in that thing. And that's how, that's how you separate them. So that makes total sense. So another thing you mentioned was abandoned carts. And that's something people on Amazon are also not used to is, you know, oh, they just go on Amazon, they click the buy box and then add it to cart and go. Whereas in, in the, in the non-Amazon real world, I was going to say in the real world, but Amazon is real world too. Uh, but in the non-Amazon world, people put stuff in their cart a lot and don't buy it. So you got to follow up with them because that's also a very high intent person who at least put it in their cart because they were like at least curious about shipping or something. So they're at least curious about the product. So what's the best way to get that person to come back and, and buy? So again, increasing the, the total number of touch points helps. So, mm -hmm. all right, you've got your remarketing strategy. You can identify people as like, they didn't just view the product. They added a cart, but didn't make a purchase. Mm -hmm. So you could remarket to them with, hey, here's a coupon code um, mm. if you wanted to. So you could really segment out that Facebook ad strategy. Then uh, the abandoned cart series. So by default, Shopify will send an email. And it's just like, you left stuff in your cart. Here's mm -hmm. a link back to your cart. That's better than nothing. Um, but if I'm just sending that email out, real, I would probably update it to be customer service focused. Hey, we saw you left this in your cart. Were there any questions we could answer? Just reply to this email. So make it about active objection busting. Mm -hmm. um, but if I want to get fancy, I want to use email automation software that lets me send multiple abandoned cart emails. So a, a, an ideal series would be number one, customer service. Hey, you left this in your cart, you didn't purchase. Can we help? Just hit reply. We're happy to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is going to also help generate a list of common objections. And then you can work that back into your product description um, or the website in general. And then they don't buy 24 hours later, another email. Hey, order today, get 10% off. 24 hours after that, oh, your 24 hour or your 10% coupon is going to expire today. So here's just a reminder. We didn't want you to lose out on that. Mm. 24 hours after that, hey, you didn't make a purchase. No hard feelings. Can, uh, can we keep you subscribed to our newsletter? We'll send you regular updates about products, offers, sales, whatever, uh, resources. But if not, here's the unsubscribe link. Obviously, like you don't want to email people who are not interested. Right. That can hurt deliverability. So you want right. to invite, then the fourth email, invite the unsubscribe. Um, and it also helps prep them that like, hey, we're going to, you're on a newsletter now. We're going <laughs> right. to do some stuff. Um, so that, that's my ideal strategy is three or four emails. A lot of people skip that, the fourth one. Um, but I like it just for trying to maintain list quality. Well, that makes sense too, because it, some people are just, you know, they're putting it in the, for whatever sense of curiosity and they put it in their email and they don't even remember why they did it and they're just going to move on. So putting in the unsubscribe, you know, to a abandoned cart person, I, I can see it makes sense. And then that way too, it's kind of like Columbia house. Remember those, uh, you know, you put yeah. in the, the stamps to get the 10 CDs for a penny or whatever. And then they just keep sending you CDs until you say stop. So it's like, I'm going to keep sending you emails until you say stop. So that makes sense. But I like the thing there about asking for their objections basically and then keeping that as a list and then you can update your sales copy not just on your own store but in your ads and also on Amazon. Yep. So there's a lot you can do with that. So I, I love that tip. I love that tip. So, all right. So just to close this up, what other advice do you have that you would share to someone who, you know, maybe they've been selling on Amazon and, you know, whether they're just getting started or they're, you know, trying to get traction or whatever the case is, and, or just flat out build what they have, you know, on a Shopify or similar type store, what else would you recommend? I think the, I would say focus on your brand story. 
So mm. Facebook ads, unfortunately, are, it's a, a wonderful tool, a powerful marketing channel, but they're getting more expensive than ever. Mm-hmm. They're getting harder than ever. And the issue is years ago, big brands were like Facebook ads. Pff, but now you have people like you know Walmart and BMW and Target running Facebook ads. Mm-hmm. And if I'm BMW, I don't really care about my, my customer acquisition cost. If I can get a kid thinking about a BMW, you know, start, I could start advertising to him at 14. All right. Mm. If I could start getting him thinking about a BMW then, then maybe he buys it 15 years later and then right. he buys three over the lifetime. So they're not thinking about customer acquisition costs in the same way as mere mortals. The thing that you as an entrepreneur, as a merchant have that these big brands will never have is a compelling personal brand story. So I would focus on, number one, write your about page. Hey, this is who I am. This is why I'm selling this. This is what I hope you get out of it. You know, tell your story and uh, include video with that as well, ideally. I mean, everyone has uh, an iPhone. I've got, this is a, a 4K webcam that was cost less than $100. So mm-hmm. there's no excuse to not be doing video. Um, and then that stuff can all be part of your remarketing strategy. So an interesting mm. thing you see happen in a Shopify store that can't happen on Amazon is someone adds an item to cart and then they click the about page. They want to know, who am I buying from? Because like a Shopify store, they, the customer gets that anyone can spin up an online store. Right. And there's a lot of scammy, of just straight up um, Instagram ads running to scam stores, right? So they, they're, they're suspicious. Having an about page with like, this is my story and here's a video and I'm a real person that can make all the difference in earning that trust and getting them to buy. And without that, it's like, realistically, how different is a a Shopify store or any online store than, you know, someone in a parking lot just popping open their trunk and yelling, hey, I got some t-shirts if you got a credit card number for me. Like, holy crap. (laughs) I'm not, (laughs) uh, uh. Um, So having that about page and sharing your story, big brands, your competition, no one can take that away from you. So I think that, that's an important point. Um, and then fo- the, the real, the value and the power of your marketing is all going to go back to your email list. The quality of that email list, the size of that email list um, is just, it pays dividends. So I would like from day one be focusing on, hey, like here are opt-in campaigns. Here's our, our welcome series. Always be focused on those emails. Awesome. Awesome. Great advice there. All right. So if somebody wanted to find you, Kurt, online, where would they go? Uh, Google me, Kurt Elster. Go to KurtElster.com. Uh, you can sign up for my newsletter there. Reply to any email. And that is my actual email address. If you send me a thoughtful question, I will send you a thoughtful reply. Awesome. Awesome. And we will uh, link to that as well. And uh, that will also link to the unofficial Shopify podcast. Good deal. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Kurt. This was, uh, this was great and helpful info. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Have a great day.